Welcome to Post in Black, everyone. My name is David Hunter Jr. and I am thrilled to have you back with us for another episode of Post in Black as we celebrate Black excellence behind the lens. Today, we are excited and very happy to have with us Daryl Jefferson, the VP of Broadcast Operations and Technology at NBC Sports Group. He was the Director of Post-Production Operations for the NBC Olympics from 2008 to 2012 and the Director of Post-Production for Lifetime Television from 2002 to 2008. He is an Emmy Award winning uh, gentleman. We are so thrilled to have him with us on today's episode. Daryl, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me today. No, no it, it is it is our pleasure. Really thrilled. And before we get started, as we always like to do, just to break the ice, we're going to have an icebreaker. Are you OK with that? Yeah, all good. All right. There'll be something to come on the bottom of your screen and everybody listening. What book do you own but have never read? I'm not sure if that's Ooh. the case, but what book have you do you own but have never read? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, ooh, <laughs> never read. That might stump me. Um, yeah. Uh, my gosh, I try to read all of them. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm I'm sure most manuals that I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to read. I, I, hear that. I certainly own them. Uh, I hear that. If, if if something else occurs to me, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, no, for sure. I saw when I when we were coming up with this question, I had to think, and there's a the book by uh, Bill Gates, the the um the speed of thought. I forget the name oh, of yeah. it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it is it's like I had it and somebody I asked for it as a gift and I have not read it. So I that's a I need to get on that. Need to yeah. get on. Indeed. But no, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, many people may not know everything about you, but we're going to dive in. Obviously, we're celebrating Black excellence behind the lens, focusing on post-production. And you have an extensive resume. Um, would you like to tell people a little bit about yourself and you know where you're from and how you even got started in the industry? Sure, sure, sure. I, uh, I grew up in Long Island uh, in uh, Suffolk County, um, mm -hmm. small town. And I um, Went to college. I went to Rutgers University, um, and i I didn't really I didn't really focus on anything uh, in broadcast or technology in my college career. I was actually pretty hyper focused on uh, political career. I was actually the first student, black student body president at, at Rutgers College, Rutgers University. Um, I, I won't. I won't get into how long ago that was, but uh, 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 and then when when I uh, graduated, I really wanted to get into children's programming. Mm. So I actually um, I took an internship with uh, Nick News uh, mm -hmm. with Linda Ellerby's production company um, uh, called Lucky Duck, and then from there I took my first job with the children's television workshop, the folks that uh, make Sesame Street. But I worked on a show called Ghost Rider. Wow. Uh, many, many, many years ago. From there, I went on to do a lot of production. I started on the production side, um, did music videos. Mm -hmm. I have wild stories about all of my years of uh, Wu-Tang videos and other uh, hip hop videos back in the yeah. day. Yeah. Uh, and then I went from there into feature films. Mm. I worked on a bunch of feature films and then I, I found my true calling uh, with technology. I always found myself fixing things F figuring out solutions for things. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up uh, first running a studio operation and then running a post audio facility. We did a, a lot of cartoon work. Wow. Uh, so we worked on Doug, we worked on um, Rugrats, uh, this type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. so, and some then. Of, some of my childhood classics. You yeah. <laughs> my exactly. classics. Love that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that was a lot of fun. And then uh, I ran uh, some post houses mm -hmm. um, and started to get more and more into the technology. Uh, ultimately, I went to Lifetime Television mm -hmm. um, and then I headed up that uh, the, the group uh, that both did uh, post production and asset management. Mm. And then I went from there and then I started work on live sports. So I, I went from there to NBC Sports. Uh, it was NBC Olympics first. I started with the Olympics group mm -hmm. in 2008. I went to Beijing and uh, kind of never looked back. After that, I, I moved on to every Olympic since. But mm -hmm. also uh, in 2012, I, uh, I was uh, given 
all of the other sports to oversee post-production um, for each of our properties. So football and hockey and NASCAR and all of that stuff. So it's it's been kind of a whirlwind since then. I mean, um, I mean that that is that right there, there. I mean, that is an incredible list of of titles that you've held, jobs, mm-hmm. jobs that you've you know worked on. You know, even some of the the things that I spoke to, even with the, the animated shows um, that I spoke to, some things that have changed me from my lifetime. Yeah. How did you even get started into post production? Because that that career obviously it took off even from Rutgers. But how yeah. did you even get started? Did you always know you wanted to work in post? No, not not at all. I, I you know, I, I, I think I think part part of and you, you'll hear me talk about this a lot when I speak to kids. Um, it's half the battle is knowing that these jobs exist mm-hmm. and that you can do this as a living and yeah. and and make a good living doing it. Um, I didn't really know what I didn't know. Um, and mm-hmm. I didn't when I when I took those first jobs out of college, I didn't realize you could do production as a pursuit. Uh, And then when I started to do it, um, I realized, oh, you can do all these different roles within production. Then when I got further into post, I realized, well, I I really enjoy this. Uh, I enjoy the technology. I enjoy coming up with solutions. Mm -hmm. I enjoy um, kind of enabling the storytelling. Um, And the, the kind of further I got into the technology, the more I realized like, wait, this is a great blend for me of the, the, the technical and the creative. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what, that's what got me. That's what hooked me. And that's what uh, kept me. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. No, that that's do You mentioned something, you're not, not even knowing these jobs exist. You mm-hmm. know, my, my brother who started post in black, that was one of the main inspirations for him being 22 years old. And people have heard this story, but 22 years old going to a post house and being the only black person there. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, everybody was much older than him. He's like, where's everybody else? And right. so he just started doing research and reaching out to people. And I, I think we've mentioned this, but telling you, one of the first people he emailed, just cold email, was Tara Lynn Shropshire. And oh, she nice. you know, took him under his wing, under her wing. And then it was kind of on from there. Yeah. So, so like you said that, was there anybody once you knew that or you knew those jobs existed? Was there anybody that you were able to reach out to yourself or kind of like look to or would you just kind of make your own lane? Well, you know, it, it's funny that there are people in almost every organization that have um, found me, connected with me, or I've reached out to and found them mm-hmm. that I liked the way they carried themselves or I liked the way they uh, kind of navigated uh, a rough patch. When I say rough patch, I mean sometimes the conflict between a creative goal and mm-hmm. the route to get there. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, people are passionate and sometimes things can get pretty real in the in in and around the edit. Yeah. Um, but when you see someone carrying themselves with with uh, grace, mm. uh, I, I always gravitated towards those people. Um, I had a, a good mentor in um, a guy named Pete Scro at Lifetime who mm-hmm. always carried himself with grace and uh, was just a great a great friend to me. And he Mm -hmm. kind of highlighted the idea that, you know, pretty much whatever you want to do, if you, if you put yourself to it, you will, you will get there quickly. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I think those folks and my, in my current uh, job, I have, uh, and he he happens to be my boss, which is also another, another thing, a guy named Dave Maza. He, he has done some outrageous and impossible things with the Olympics over the years mm-hmm. to expose me to, to possibility um, mm-hmm. at scale when you're dealing with, you know, thousands of hours of content in two weeks. Yeah. Uh, it's daunting. It's very yeah. daunting to, to, to think about. Uh, and um, I don't know, see, seeing those, those folks, uh, again, under pressure with grace is is an inspiration to me. Und, under pressure with grace. I love that. I love that. Now, I, I did watch an interview of yours where you talked about working on the Olympics, and I believe they were throwing out some crazy stats, mm. uh, with like 750 hours and like 18 days of content. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't even, I'm not in post, but I came into the industry as an actor and a writer. And mm-hmm. so my, me knowing a lot more about post because of my brother and all the interviews and, you know, post houses I've been in, 
I know that 750 hours is a lot just in life, <laughs> but but you did that in two weeks. Talk, can you talk yeah. about your your day and your schedule with when it comes to the Olympics and how the even sure. getting that job came about? Yeah, um, yeah. So so the Olympics, I, I always describe as you know, you, you think of your your worst possible day, um, and then you multiply that because <laughs> you have. You know, not one event to carry off, but maybe at worst thirty events to carry off on on a single day. So we do have we we will have around four thousand hours of content mm. um, over the course of eighteen days, mm. um, and it's just a lot to to tell. Bring the stories of import to the fore, to tell the right stories to really hook, you know, uh, young people and, and older people alike. Um, it's just a lot to do over that period of time. Mm -hmm. The way I got started, um, uh, I was certainly lower in the totem pole and there had been, um, folks that had been with the Olympic group. I often just des describe us, uh, and I say this lovingly mm -hmm. as circus folk, because very much like a circus, you roll into some country, um, don't know anything. You set up shop and you basically build a broadcast center mm -hmm. and then beat the, the living nonsense out of that broadcast center for, for a couple of weeks, then pull out of there and act like nothing happened. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. uh, uh, so those folks have been doing it for a long time. I was the, uh, the whippersnapper of the group, but, um, once you kind of get one under your belt and you understand stand the size and scope of the event, it's yeah. it's really addictive. Um, yeah, okay. I find, um, and, and it's it's you know you 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 get a chance to meet and talk to these young athletes, and you realize it's it's our responsibility to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. And when you get them coming off of the track or getting out of the pool or whatever whatever field of play they're on you realize like this is not a fabricated moment. You are seeing the absolute real emotion. This isn't a produced moment. They are happy, they are dejected, whatever emotion they're there, you're, you're, you're taking in that history and they've worked this their entire lives for this moment. It's such a responsibility for us to tell their story, um, their full story mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and bring that home to the American uh, public. Um, that, that for me is the, the mantle responsibility. That's what turns me on yeah. about what, about what we do, what we can, how we can describe someone's story with, uh, with something technical or, or maybe, you know, give them a little, a uh, little taste of how they got there, this type of mm -hmm. thing. It's, it's, it's good stuff. No, that, that's powerful. And, and I could hear the excitement. And for those of you watching this episode, you can see it in, in how you talk and describe it. You know, something for me that 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 comes to mind is all the work that has to go into play, because we talk to various people who are editors and working behind the scenes on documentaries or doing this on um, ads or, or TV or film. What is the preparation like for doing something like a live event and editing and putting that together? Because I know you, you, there's a lot of different work that, are, you know, things that go into that. Yes. What, well said. Um, yeah. So we, we plan months and months and months, um, mm -hmm. in advance, almost a year and well, almost, almost 15 months ahead, ahead of time. Uh, we ship, um, between 150 and 200 big C containers to mm -hmm. that, um, that city, those big, you know, those big, uh, yeah, I want to say you know, barges. Yeah. First for somebody uh, that doesn't know what a big what the, the containers are what what is that if they're watching they're saying what is he talking about yeah like, so uh I'm, I'm trying to think like you see them in action movies when they when they go on some industrial barge right. and they're these gigantic sea containers yeah 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 that that for us are loaded with electronics that we uh pre-configure that we pre-build that we pre-wire and slide them into those sea containers, along with our office furniture, along with our personal effects, this type of thing. And they're shipped by barge to the, the next port of call. When we get there, we have to, you know, rewire everything up, connect everything. Um, and hopefully we, we pre-configured it as much as we can. Um, because, you know, when you get into all these countries, there's different foibles and different, mm -hmm. um, 
details uh, right. for every country. So you get there and uh, reconnect everything up and, and go from there. Right. Um, but that's, um, it's years in the making. Each games is years in the making. Mm -hmm. um, but that the process of building, configuring, shipping is about 15 months. Gotcha. Uh, but for this, for this year, it's interesting because of the, the COVID circumstance, um, the, the games is postponed till this summer in 21. Right. But that means for the first time for any broadcaster, we're actually producing two games within six months of each other. We have the summer games in Tokyo, and then we'll have a winter games um, in Q1 of 22. Um, so um, it's, it's a lot. And in the middle of the games, we'll also do a Super Bowl. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I guess I, a question, you know, this is kind of a seg a break in between the ed and then I'll come back to it. But mm -hmm. what, what is a what is a, a work life balance look like for you? Because this is a commitment. This is a it's not a not just a commitment. It's a life, a life. Yeah, yeah you know it's I mean? it's yeah, no, it, it's it definitely true. I, you know, during the big events like the Olympics, I am generally within in that host country. So I'm often away from my family for a good deal of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be in Tokyo for two, a little over two months. Mm. Um, and then again for Beijing for probably a, a same period of time. Um, for a Super Bowl, you're away for a few weeks. Yeah. Uh, that they're happening concurrently. I have to figure out how, how to be <laughs> in both places at once. Right. Right. Um, but honestly, it's 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 the honor of a lifetime to be able to kind of, you know, see, see the world in some cases, like my wife's been able to join me on, uh, in different ports of call. You can kind of, you know, uh, as it says in the brochure, you see the world, uh, yeah. and, 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 uh, and so on. Um, but it is difficult. There, there are definitely long days sports, um, uh, being involved in sports production is tough because mm -hmm. when most people are resting and kicking back, you're in high gear, right? Yeah, yeah, every weekend, yeah. every weekend, when everyone else is having that beer on the couch watching the game, you are yeah. sweating it out uh, yeah. on, uh, on the truck or in the broadcast facility, making that game possible. So it's yeah. it's uh, it's it's child the balance is challenging in short, yeah. but I I don't know based on all of my friends in other industries, I don't know that it's any better uh, no, in, yeah, in, I, in, in most places nowadays. I yeah. would I would say I on, I'm on a much lower scale, but uh, for years in LA, I worked as a, a tour guide at the, mm -hmm. at the Kodak Theater, Dolby Theater, but mm -hmm. I did voiceovers. And so my boss um, allowed me to like work in the capacity at the Oscars. So I did the voice of God for the Oscars oh, for wow. the theater. So nice. when you talk about people sitting at home and watching, uh, you know, as an actor, I want to watch too, but like I was literally working and it's, you know, months, weeks in advance doing all of that prep. And then when the show is live and happening, I mean, you're enjoying it, but you're not really, you're just like, when is our next break? This is commercial. Right. Here's there. So I can only imagine what's on your plate. Uh, I, I had a small napkin. You had a full plate. <laughs> <laughs> you had a full plate. Um, you know, I, I want to touch on something, too, because, again, we, we do call it post and black. But just I don't think speaking my personal experience and the may be ignorant, but I don't know if I ever knew that there was a possibility that a black man or a black person in general would have the type of responsibility for the Olympics, mm -hmm. you know, that you have. What, mm -hmm. what What is that like? And have you seen, you know, are, are there others like yourself who we just aren't aware of or, you know, how is that working in that field being the one? with so much responsibility, so much power, and then carrying the mantle of being a black man in this industry. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a challenging thing. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the thing I, I try to do is reach out and mentor. Uh, I, I will say this. Um, I generally reach out to all of the others uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and not, not just ones that look like me, but, you know, right. getting more women involved getting more right. people in color in general involved right. i spent a lot of time mentoring and coaching um i make it abundantly clear um to co-workers and colleagues alike that um they will get the truth from me uh yeah. regardless of how convenient yeah. uh but they will also get an honest ear or if they need a sounding board 
they need help navigating a situation. Mm -hmm. um, I try to bring that grace um, myself, but I also, sometimes you just need to let people know that you're there, that you're a resource mm -hmm. and that they're not alone. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the biggest thing. And so many of the athletes, I remember being, I, I, I apologize because over time, all the Olympic cities kind of meld into one gigantic city because you mm -hmm. can't remember where was I when, when I was at a winter games in one of the, um, there, uh, speed skater, um, uh, he and I, um, uh, made eye contact down the hall yeah. and, we approached each other um, and there was real recognition. I was seen, he was seen. Mm. Um, and there's, there's so many moments of that when you see one another out there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's with an athlete or with a, another person who's, you know, pulling cables or running with a clipboard. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you have that moment of recognition, it goes beyond the nod. It goes, it gets to, I see you and recognize you yeah. and I, I appreciate you. You know, like, uh, I, I think those moments are very nourishing for me mm -hmm. um, and they help me carry on and help me fight harder to get more of us in there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I can definitely uh, relate to that. And I, I did on a, on a, again, a lower scale. I remember one of my coworkers asking me, um, they said, Hey, you're, you're at the Oscars and Samuel Jackson just said hi to you. Do, do you know him? And I said, no, I, no, I, like honest lie, like honest truth. I told him, I said, look around. I said, I'm a black man with a headset and a notebook calling the show, I'm not security. And there's and there's three thousand people here, and and I'm, and I'm young. He's like, hey man, what are you doing? Cool, you know what I mean? Because right. I'm not, I'm not not saying that being an usher or anything like that is bad, but you don't usually see like, oh, you have some responsibility. Right. Oh, you, oh, okay. Oh, you're not just, oh man, good to see you. And yeah. they don't, they don't really understand uh, people who aren't in our, in our situation don't understand that, that it's really powerful. Those visuals when yeah. you see that. Um, yeah. So, so, so powerful. It, you talk about the community and had some of the people, you mentioned some names who have been there for you, but would you say the, the community of the, the post world for what you're doing is a close one or have you had to kind of make your own way and, and just ha how has it been navigating that? Oh, I, I think I think it is close, and I, I think when you again when that passion mm -hmm. hits tech, technical expertise, um, you can argue, um, and I, I I believe in kind of really standing your ground when you believe in something either artistically or uh, technically. Mm -hmm. But I, I've had some you know shouting matches about it, uh, whether a technical solution is the right one. Right. Um, is this the right time to deploy such a uh, a risk or will it bring something to tell the story a bit further? Um, and I think with that, you get through a bunch of those things and everyone realizes like, hey, you're yelling at me, but it's because you wanted the best thing for this show. Mm -hmm. I love you, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? You know, and it, it gets yeah. real fast. Like, oh, yeah, we were just yelling, but that's that you got 100% me, I got 100% you. There's nothing but love here, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think that brings that co the community together. I will also shout out, um, I'm a co-lead of the uh, Black Employees Network at, um, at NBC Sports Group. Okay. Um, and there's a tight-knit community of Black people working in that building um, and throughout the country at our regional sports networks. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you like this past year, I don't know that emotionally I would have gotten through it if it weren't for some broad shoulders of yeah. my brothers and sisters around the, the organization. Cause no. you can, again, you can let it go and you can, yeah. you can be, be, be real with your family. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's special. It's necessary. It's necessary. Yeah. Those, those moments just to breathe, like you're saying, is you know, we have to kind of let it out sometimes and have somebody understand you and not, you know, think, oh, Daryl's losing it. Oh, he's yeah. going, he's mad. It's like you can say something and be frustrated and they're like, all right, cool, let's get a coffee. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, it's just, you know, water off the shoulders, water off the back. It, in terms of people that are coming into the industry, because there are a lot of young people who are looking at the entertainment industry and saying, I don't know what I want to do, but I know I want to be in that field. 
What is the selling point to say, hey, you need to come into post-production. This could be an opportunity for you to have a lifetime. Uh, you know, obviously it's hard. It's still about relationships. You still have to do the yeah. work. But what What's the selling point to say, don't don't leave that and come over here? Yeah, I, I think it, it comes down to authentic storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. Like for, for so many generations, we rely on others to present the tools to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And there's an opportunity here to get a whole lot more voices in the room and tools uh, and perspectives to tell stories of people from our community, people outside of our community and so on. Um, and I, I think it's it's really a, uh, an open and welcoming community to mm -hmm. new voices. And you mm -hmm. won't find that in every community. Right. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I would, I would say, and because video is such a medium today between the social aspect and, you know, uh, all the social outlets and so forth, being skilled at cutting video mm -hmm. is, a, is a skill that um, serves one well as a calling card, serves one well, um, gaining, gaining attention, this type of thing. I, I think it's a, a great place to be. I, I, I agree with you. I've learned so much. Again, just you know, shadowing my brother from early days, 2008, 2009, and I was going into houses and I remember he was telling me, he said, you know, I'll watch everything that you're in as an actor, but if it sounds better, the editing's bad, I will not, I will not support it. And I was like, oh, right. okay. So he, yeah. he was clear about that. Um, yeah. Obviously, we you have dropped so much knowledge and insight today, and we really thank you for your time. Again, you mentioned you're working on the Olympics. Is there anything else that we can um, stay up to date with what you're working on and where can oh, we stay in yeah. contact? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, we'll, uh, we're in the middle of hockey season now, and we're doing yeah. a whole lot of golf production. Um, we have a Honda Classic coming up next weekend. Uh, in the beginning of May, we'll return to the Kentucky Derby and th that whole Triple Crown season. Yeah. Um, then on to the Tour de France and then um, to uh, Olympics, then football, and, and on uh, around we go again. Um, yeah. And this summer, NASCAR – um, we'll see Michael Jordan's, uh, new race car. So, uh, that mm -hmm. should be interesting, uh, okay, this summer. Yeah. So th there's, there's always sports on and hopefully, uh, hopefully you can catch some of that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge sports fan. So, you know, I'm, I'm probably one of you, one of the people watching the algorithm go up on your end. Just <laughs> on my anything I could watch laptop TV, it's all on there. So, uh, yeah. Darryl, we thank you so much for your time. This has been a joy to have you on post in black. Uh, for those of you tuning in, whether you're listening on our Spotify or Anchor, wherever you're listening or watching, please stay tuned for new episodes of Post and Black. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media channels at Made for More Entertainment. And we thank you again for tuning in. We'll see you next time.